Hello, it's Emily Morehouse Ears here from Healthscape, and I'm just wanting to talk to you today about um, a little bit of the science behind the PH360 platform and an overview of the six health types. So the key thing I want you guys to take home is that we're all different. Every single one of us on this planet is unique. And what we are, what, we are, what makes us who we are, is a mixture of our genes. Now, there's around about 25,000 genes. Um, this is our DNA, and this is what we get from our mum and our dad. And this doesn't change throughout our entire lifetime. Our DNA stays the same. But what we now know is that our environment and our lifestyle actually controls how our genes express. So um, our genes and our environment and our lifestyle makes us who we are. And who we are right now and what we look like, this is called our phenotype. And this changes. So for example, if I was to um, eat bad food for the next six months, um, and I was a bit lazy and I, I didn't do much in the way of exercise and I didn't sleep well, um, and I was stressed, things that we might see changes in my body, it might be I might put on a little bit of weight, I might lose muscle, um, I might have bad skin, or I might um, you know, just, just look drained, I wouldn't have that kind of energetic look so much, and I may be getting a few health problems or some, some illnesses coming up, because my immune system might be suppressed. So I would still have exactly the same DNA, and I'd still be the Emily that people know, but I'd just be a, a different version of Emily, I'd be a, probably a, a heavier, um, less vibrant and less healthy version of Emily. On the flip side, if I, um, you know, if I go to the gym and do some resistance training, then I'll be expressing strength genes um, and I would increase in, in, in muscle and I'll create increase in strength. If I was to eat really well for the next six months um, and, you know, I live really in alignment with what works with me and I'm not too stressed um, and I'm eating good food and I'm doing good exercise and I'm getting good sleep and I'm not, I'm not too stressed, I'm having a pretty balanced life, then on the flip side, I'm probably going to look a lot healthier, I'm gonna be a lot healthier, I'm gonna be kind of the best version of myself. So I'm still gonna have the same DNA, the healthy version of Emily and the really unhealthy version of Emily, it's still the same DNA, it's just different environment and lifestyle causing different genes to express and meaning that my phenotype will change. So this is all what the science of epigenetics is. So epigenetics is all about um, um, how, you know, how our lifestyle environment um, relates to our gene expression. Um, so as I said, genes don't change, but what's really, really amazing is that we can control what genes switch on and off, which is really awesome because that means that if we do have diabetes genes or obesity genes, um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. We actually have control over these things. If we understand the environment, that the environment can control things and can switch things on or off, it gives us a lot more control over our over, over our health and over our body, which is fantastic. So um, now, something that you might notice here is that exercise is spelt wrong. It's something that, that's annoyed me. Um, this is a, a, something that I got off the internet, and my brain um, picks up little details. And the interesting thing is this comes up in my PH360 platform that I've got uh, that kind of fault finder <laughs> tendency, and it's very true. Um, but did you know that every time that you move, you're actually changing how your genes turn on and off. So it's not just our um, exercise and our nutrition that affects our health and how our genes express, because I think we all know that. It's everything in our environment. It's, it's the air that we breathe. It's the water that we drink. It's the um, toxins that are in the environment. It's also to do with our emotional health. Our thoughts, I mean, thoughts are just molecules. Um, it's, it's, it's a big entire picture. It's also to do with our sleep, to do with our stress levels. Everything in our environment, who, who we're around, um, all this stuff, this affects um, how our genes express and therefore also uh, what our health is like. So the very cool thing about this, I think, is that we have a lot more control over our end result, over our health than we ever, than we thought, ever thought that we um, did have, which is fantastic. So this is a, um, if you can guess here what these two ladies are, the relationship to each other. So these ladies are identical twins. So hard to believe, right? These, these two ladies have exactly the same DNA. So that, but what you can see is that this lady here will have ex exposed her body to a different environment um, to, to the lady on the left here. So her body has obviously um, put on a lot of weight 
she probably has switched on genes for things like diabetes because with that sort of blood sugar control that often comes with obesity. Um, so you can see that their phenotype is quite different and obviously different genes are switched on and off, but their DNA is identical. And what we now know is that 95% of our health, and I suppose the end result of what we are living and breathing right now is to do with our environment. Um, researchers agree that somewhere between one to 5% of, of our health and of illnesses are, ge are genetically determined. That means it's just genetic and we can't do anything about it. But that 95% or more is to do with our environment. And so we can have genes that lead us to be more predisposed to certain illnesses or to certain conditions. But that doesn't mean that we're defined by that and that we are going to get those things. It depends what environment and lifestyle we have, whether those genes are expressed or not. So as I said, 95% of it, of things are in our own hands. We really have a lot of control over, over our health and well-being, which is fantastic news. So the current problems um, out there at the moment, I mean, if you look on the net, there are, there's you know, a whole lot of advice. In fact, is that we don't have a, in the health industry, we don't have a problem with lack of information. We've got a problem with too much information and it's all conflicting. You know, you'll have um, nutrition programs um, or nutrition like diets and it's all like, oh, this is the best thing. And it's got um, science to back it and it's got research to back it and doctors are touting it. And there's all this anecdotal evidence of this working. And then over here, you've got another diet that's the opposite. that They've got exactly the same sort of stuff there. They'll have training plans. It says download this training plan. This is how you're going to get really strong through your middle. And this is how you're going to improve your athletic performance. And this is how you're going to rehab your knee and all these sorts of things. But the problem is, is that they're assuming that there's a kind of a one size fits all, is that what will work for one person will work for the next person. But what we know is it's just, just is not the case. And every study there is out there, whether it's a study for a nutritional intervention or exercise or a drug or whatever it is, in every research thing, there are always the group of non-responders. And it's a known normal thing that around about 30% of people in every study won't respond. So um, you know, people may, um, there's a typical example of a VO2 max study. VO2 max is a, is a measurement of your aerobic fitness. And, you know, participants over the period of 12 weeks were all doing, you know, the same amount of exercise in a very controlled environment. And some people over that time, their VO2 max went up hugely. Other people, their VO2 max went up only a little bit. And small group of people, their VO2 max didn't change at all. And even for a couple of people, it went down. So how can you spend 12 weeks doing intense exercise and your fitness actually gets worse? So this is the same thing. We have um, boot camps and stuff where people will do 12-week boot camps and they're getting up three mornings a week really early, doing high-intensity training, and pushing stuff really, really, really hard. And you'll have some, some people that will thrive in that environment. You know, they'll feel fantastic. They'll lose weight. Their energy will increase. It just sets them up and their mental clarity for the day is really good. And other people will do just as much work. They'll drag themselves out of bed early. They'll, they'll push themselves really, really hard. But they just, it just makes them even more tired. They don't lose weight or if they do lose it, they only lose a little bit of weight. And then often they put that back on afterwards because their body's so stressed. And they might come out for all their hard work over those 12 weeks. They may come out of it having not changed their weight at all. The energy is, 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 is terrible and they've got a sore knee. So... It's not the environment, what, what, we, what we now know is that we can't put everyone in the same environment or give them the same things to do and expect people to get the same results. You'll get different results for different people and you'll have certain things that are more suited to one person than another. So in society in general, we don't really consider the individual needs enough and this is something that really, really needs to change. Um, and that, but the solution to this is really cool is that we need to match the environment to your specific genes. And this is what the science of personalized health is all about. We're making sure that you're putting people in their environment where they're going to thrive and where it's going to reduce their overall stress load and where it puts their body in a place of flow where things are easy. And um, the cool thing is the PH360 platform is the most advanced um, personalized health platform in the world. All right. So the PH360 platform, here's the little, uh, the circle or the wheel and the six different health types that we, we use as a way to kind of um, build understanding and knowledge, which we'll go into a little bit more. What the platform does is it maps all of those 25,000 genes that I was talking about. And the most important things, it can actually account for the epigenetic factors. So what genes are switching off and what genes are switching on for you right now? 
there's actually 15 layers of science that are built into the platform. So whenever you, all your data goes into the platform, it's filtered through the knowledge that they've gained through 15 different sciences. One of those is epigenetics that I've been talking about, but there's also um, neuroscience and chronobiology, which is all about the timing, which we're going to go into a lot uh, more about, because that's really important. The embryology, which I'm about to talk about next, nutrigenomics, how nutrition affects your genes, molecular biology, neuropsychology, and even the evidence-based components of traditional Chinese medicine um, and Ayurvedic medicine. So all that data goes into the system. There's over 10,000 computations and 500 algorithms. It's a pretty advanced, complex system. Everything is factored into the platform. So you don't need to worry if you don't understand the science or you don't understand everything I'm talking about. That's completely fine. It's all factored in and it comes out with really easy information for you to understand. And it gives you an idea of your unique bio trend. As I said, every single person on the planet is different and every single person's platform will be unique as well. So, as I said, it will take the 15 different layers of science. It will also, it's not new stuff, it's actually, it's collating information that we've got from many areas of health and science over the, over the centuries and over the decades, and it's pulling it all together, and they've sort of advanced on that stuff a lot more as well, and, and made things a lot more kind of accurate. So they're taking all that prior knowledge and information from all these different areas of science and putting it together into, um, into this sort of platform where it can spit out some really simple and easy information for you in terms of what's best for you to eat, um, ideas for your exercise and also lifestyle factors as well, social mind, career, um, and place. And so, um, yeah, and not only does it give you personalized information for you in a holistic way, it does it for you right now because our requirements change over time. If we were a baby, our requirements in terms of nutrition and exercise is obviously quite different to what we're, it is for when we're now. If we were a 70 year old, those requirements would change too. If we are an elite athlete and expending a lot of energy and we need to be performing in high performance, our, our requirements in these areas are going to be different. If we're a sedentary worker in our 50s, uh, or if we're going through menopause, or um, if we're breastfeeding or pregnant, our, obviously our nutritional and um, our lifestyle requirements are going to be different. So the cool thing about the PH60 platform is it doesn't, doesn't only take into consideration your unique phenotype and what you are right now, but it's everything to do with what you are right now. And um, even with the seasons, it will change with you there because our requirements actually change um, with the seasons, with what time zones we're in, with what foods in, uh, um, in seasons. So the cool thing is the platform changes with you, with your current health status as you age. All right, so the key thing I want you guys to get um, an understanding of is how do the skeletal measurements that we do on the outside of the body tell us about what's happening inside the body? So to give you a little bit of an understanding about that, we're going to start by talking about embryology. So the science of embryology. Now, when your mum and dad um, had a really awesome time and you were conceived, however many years ago that was, um, you started off as um, a single cell, and that cell doubled and doubled and doubled until you got to 64 cells and then it starts to specialize and it builds into the three dermal layers the ectoderm the mesoderm and the endoderm now in these different layers this is where different organs and tissues develop so in the layer of the ectoderm this is where the central nervous system so the brain and the spinal cord and the skin develops so think of this as being our kind of our thinking organs in the layer of the mesoderm this is where Everything to do with movement um, has been developed. So these are things like our heart and our red blood cells and our muscle and our fascia and our bones, our adrenal glands. And in the layer of the endoderm, this is where the whole of the digestive system is built. So think of it as kind of digestive tissues. Also the lungs, um, also things like the thyroid. So a lot of the stuff, um, uh, the pancreas, so a lot of stuff to do with metabolism and digestion. Now, obviously... To be a human being, we have all three layers of um, this tissue um, developed. Uh, we have all three layers. However, what we now know is that a mixture of the genes that we get from our mum and dad and the environment in, our, in the mother's womb will mean that certain layers develop more. So we'll get more energy putting towards developing one or two of these dermal layers during embryological development. And it depends what that embryological development was will depend what your end structure as an adult is, skeletal structure. 
So if you had more energy put towards the level, the layer of the ectoderm during embryological development, you will become a more slender build. You will have smaller muscles naturally. You'll be less likely to carry um, adipose tissue or fat tissue. You'll have uh, a finer bone structure and you'll have more of a kind of a slender, more pencil-like build. If you had more energy put towards the layer of the mesoderm during embryological development, you will tend to have a shorter um, leg bone there. So you'll have a generally a slightly shorter stature, but you'll have a more defined muscular stature and kind of medium density to your bones. If you had more energy put towards the endodermal layer, um, then you will be the naturally the bigger and the biggest and a more heavier build because you will naturally have thicker joints and um, thicker bone structure and stronger muscles naturally, and you'll be more likely to put on adipose tissue, fat tissue naturally in the normal state. So you can see that depending on what layers have had more energy put towards in their embryological development, you can see how that plays into what we look like um, as, as an adult, which gives, so if we can go reverse engineer that and we know what you're like as an adult. Now, I'm not talking about if you're underweight or overweight or if you're toned or an, an athlete or if you're out of shape. It doesn't matter because your skeletal structure, the way your bones are and your joints are, they that, that's what we're measuring with a pH of 60. We're measuring a lot of the, the ratios between and the um, between certain joints and, and lengths and things like that. And this is of the skeleton. That doesn't change whether you're underweight or overweight. So if we can understand as an adult what your structure is, can you see how we can reverse engineer that and get an idea, an insight into what your embryological development was like? Now, as I said, you, you will have more energy put towards either one or two layers um, during embryological development. So what PH 360 have done is they've gone past just the three basic um, kind of body types um, or somatotypes. Um, and they have built that into the six health types, which is where you'll get mixes between people that have got, um, you know, between the ectodermal and the mesodermal layer, the mesodermal and the endodermal layer, and the endodermal and the ectodermal layer. And you can kind of visualize how that will play out in terms of the mixture um, of genes there to get different statures from that there. So that's what we're going to go on to next. So this is, the, this is the circle that PH360 uses. Um, so PH360 stands for Personalized Health, 360 degrees. So you can see that there's the wheel here that they use. Now, um, there's numbers that go every five degrees around the wheel. So when you get um, do the measurements um, and you set yourself up with the PH360 platform, your coach will be able to let you know what number you come up with. And I'm a 150 activator, so I'm an activator right on the cusp of a connector there. And what that will do is that will give me a real understanding of my morphology or what my body shape is like, the ratios of my body is like. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm the same as every other 150 activator, not at all, because um, some, some, for some of us, we're more out to the outer side of the wheel where we're really strongly, for example, an activator and we really will identify with a lot of the activator traits. And for others of us, we'll be more towards the middle of the circle where we have a lot more interplay between the other health types because we aren't all one health types. We all have different threads and strands from, and um, um, themes that come through from these different health types. We, all are, we, all, we are all a mixture. The health types is just the teaching tool. It's a way of us understanding the, the main trends that we see and the differences between um, different people there as well. So it's a good way of building understanding, but we've just got to remember that every single person is unique and that we all do have elements and traits from all the different health types, including in this, um, I could be a 150 activator, um, but I have blue eyes and blonde hair and a more olive skin, and my parents have these certain things going on with them, or my genealogy. So you can see how all these things affect our genes, and that will be different to other 150 activators. Um, so as I say, we're all completely unique, and what it will do is it will change for people over time as well. So. Um, yeah, this is giving you a little bit of an understanding. So the activator, if we go back to that um, embryological development, the activator is the pure mesomorph. So from that last screen, the guardian is the pure endomorph and the sensor is the pure ectomorph. So what the PH360 um, wheel has done is they've put those together. So if you've had um, the ectoderm and the mesodermal layers, if you've had energy put into more energy put into those two layers of the derm, 
you are a mixture and you're called a crusader. If you've had more energy put towards the layers of the mesoderm and the endoderm, then you're what we call a connector. And you'll have a mixture of traits between these two here. And if you're a diplomat, you'll have had more energy put towards, towards the layer of the endoderm and the ectoderm. And you'll have a mixture of traits between these two areas here. So you can see how we're starting to build an understanding of what the trends will be between um, these different people based on what the embryological development would be. And what we know is based on the embryological development, it, it makes a difference to what dominant hormones and neurotransmitters um, kind of naturally are in our body and through adolescence. And what you'll see is that plays a lot, plays a lot of a role into the way that we think into our genius and what, how, and what environments we thrive in work-wise, into what exercises we're more suited to, what foods we're more suited to, or, or the timings of things. There's so much stuff that we actually can understand once we understand what people's skeletal structure is. So it's really, really interesting. All right. I hope you guys are still with me. There's a lot of information to take in. I'm now going to go into a quick overview of the health types. So keep in mind when we're talking about the health types that it's a generalization. We're, we're giving a generalization of what it will be like to be an activator, but not everyone will resonate with everything in their, in their health type because, again, we're mixtures of a lot of different things. So, and when I'm talking about these things, we're, we're trying to almost make a caricature to, to really emphasize and to teach the differences between the health types. Um, but none of us are a caricature, we are our own unique self. So, just keep that in mind. And what I want you to do is I want you to just sit back and let this information kind of. Um, just, just kind of filter in and I want you to sit there thinking of like yourself and your partner and your kids or your family or your work colleagues and just start to think, oh yeah, that person sounds like this person or this person sounds like that. And what it does, it starts us to build a little bit more awareness of ourselves, but also awareness of the other people around us and the reason that they are the way they are and the reasons why we are um, the way we are. So I feel that um, a lot of the, the, the information that comes out of PH360 is the, the, one of the greatest strengths is that it helps us to build more awareness of ourselves and of the people around us, which also breeds um, a lot more tolerance and understanding as well. Now, I could talk about each of the health types for a good hour each. Um, I'm going to try and do it in a few minutes each. So just come away with a couple of key words that you remember out of each of the health types, and that would be, that would be great. All right. So the activator. Now, the activator is the pure mesomorph, if you think of those embryological layers. So they are um, dominant in that mesodermal layer. And if you remember back to the screen a couple, of, a couple of slides ago, in the mesodermal layer, it's all of the tissues and organs that are uh, for movement. So you can understand why these guys are natural um, athletes and they're really built to move. Exercise is so important for them. Now, their body is going to be shorter. They're going to have more of a defined muscle and a more, a more of a V-shape, so kind of like nice, uh, wide, broad shoulders. So a lot of the CrossFit athletes out there um, with the short levers and the, the powerful bodies and the sprinters, that's often these activators there. And one of the reasons why is because, which we'll talk about in a second, is that they naturally have more testosterone during adolescence. Um, doesn't matter if they're male or female, they'll just have a little bit more testosterone, and that's why... They've got that slightly long, um, shorter leg bone, so they've a slightly shorter stature, and also why you'll see a more defined kind of a Ripley muscle look. Now, we use different animals to describe um, different health types. Um, and the activator is what we call the big cat. So if you think of a cat, a, a big wild cat, is if they hear a rustling in the bushes, what do you think they will do? They, 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 in fact, they won't even think. They'll just, they'll just do, they'll just go, they'll pounce they will chase because as soon as they hear that rustling in the bushes, they will think prey and they're a natural predator. So that, they, they go hard. They sprint. One second they're sprinting along um, after their prey. The next second they're relaxing and lying um, under a tree in the sunshine. So this is what the activator's physiology is built for. It's built for um, short periods of high intensity in terms of movement and then complete rest. Go hard, rest hard. So just like I said before, if the, the wild cat um, hears a rustle in the bushes, they're not going to sit there and think, hmm, I wonder what that rustling has come from. I wonder what animal is doing that. Oh, I see that there's some potholes in the way. If I'm running, I'd better be careful and I'm going to navigate all those obstacles. The activator is a really, has a, 
a naturally a really impulsive or sort of reactive type physiology where they don't have to think about it. They just do. They can turn on a dime. They're just really built to, to just go for it. So they tend to act first and think later. And as part of that kind of, um, they just naturally have a lot of energy and a lot of oomph and a lot of do. And they, they just, that's really important for them to kind of express and just kind of let that energy and what they think kind of out of their body. So they have a real need to express. Now, some people might see this as being them being slightly blunt or direct um, or sometimes even slightly rude. Um, really what it is, it's just they it's really important for them to speak their mind and to get stuff off their chest. It's not good for them to bottle things up. Now, again, thinking of the, the big wild cat licking their lips there. These are the hangry people. They need to eat five to six meals a day. They've got a fast metabolism. They're always on the go. So they need to eat regularly. And if they don't, they'll get hangry. <laughs> You'll know about it. They also do the best with, um, they also do really well. Um, they can tolerate animal protein really, really well. So naturally, they're the more carnivorous. As I said, these guys are go hard and then rest hard. They're going to be sprinting after prey and then relaxing in the sun. So this, this theme, if you remember this theme, it plays through everything, um, every part of the activator's life. So um, with exercise, I'd be well suited to HIIT training or circuit training or kind of a lot of sports when they're doing anaerobic stuff where it's a sprint and then it's a rest. It's a sprint and it's a rest. But this also plays into the way that their mind works. So they're better at doing high intensity thinking or a task one task and then taking a break or then moving on to another task. So they don't do well with monotonous nine to five sedentary jobs. They need that variety and that stimulation and to be kind of working hard on a task and then to be switching to something else. So if you remember that they're quite kind of on the off, that's a good thing to remember with an activator. And this is because of their main hormones, which are actually the, the sort of the stress hormones. So adrenaline in particular, so they naturally have more adrenaline in their system and they'll seek out situations where they'll have more adrenaline because that's how their body feels safe. That's why they are so good with acute stress. That's why they can sprint after things and they can see, hear that rustle in the bushes and within two seconds they're, they're off and they're sprinting um, because they're so good with acute stress. They, um, they, they can also kind of clear metabolites and things really fast. So they only need a small rest and then they can be off again. That's why they seek out situations where they love change, they love variety, and they actually seek out risk to a certain degree because that's exciting. So you can see how um, they're great with acute stress, but the problem is if you've got a lot of the stress hormones coursing through your system, you can see how it would be really hard for them to want to relax and stop. They're on, but then they need to be off. And we'll get to that in a second, but that's where they have this paradox where they are, they are, they are go, go, go type of people, but they really, really need to rest in order to not burn out. Now, the other key um, hormone that I've sort of mentioned before in an activator is testosterone. Now, this is why they have the slightly shorter stature and the more muscular defined build, but it's also why they love competition and they thrive in a, in a challenging environment. They can sometimes be seen to be a little bit aggressive. That can kind of go with their, sometimes they can have that slightly fiery nature as well. Um, this is just a natural part of the way they are and them being them. So again, they need to go hard, but then they really need to learn to rest because that's, that's if not, they'll end up getting things like adrenal fatigue. All right, now we're going from one side of the wheel to the other. We're going from the fast, wild cat that's agile and can sprint around and turn on a dime. We're going to the slow, steady, strong, easy-paced, controlled diplomat. So the diplomat is the ecto endo mix. So if you think of what um, was developed in the layer of the ectoderm, it was the nervous system, right? So they have a really strong mind. They've got a logical mind. So they, they'll do a lot of thinking, naturally. They'll process things through thought. But they also have this element of the endodermal layers. Now, we, what we know is with endomorph, which we'll find out a little bit more as we talk through these, is that the endomorph physiques, they have, it's a really a nurturing type thing. It's all about the family and people around them. There's a huge amount of empathy. So diplomats have an amazing mix where they've got a real strong logical mind and they'll think through everything, but then they also need to consider, they're really empathetic and they need to consider how that decision will affect 
everyone around them and their family. So you can see that they have a lot of things to consider and why it can take them a little bit longer to make decisions. And it's also why they get their name, the diplomats, because they, they can see things from everything, everyone's point of view and they like to kind of keep, that mind, um, keep those decisions with everyone in mind. So in terms of their body, again, if you think of what, um, what I was talking about with the statues with the different dermal layers and a couple of slides ago, you can sort of see how they would have that stronger, bigger build because of the endoderm, but that they also have um, the, um, the height that might come from the ectodermal um, range. So the, the, there's a huge range in the shapes and sizes of a diplomat. You've got at one end close to the guardian, you've got the Rock Johnston, um, so you can see quite a big, a big unit, and then you're going right through to someone like Nicole Kidman, who would be um, a diplomat on the border of a censor. So you can see how those shapes and sizes are quite different. Um, they'll get more of, a, they'll get a thinner, more pencil-like build, just a bigger version um, when they're close to the censor. So yeah, it's really interesting to, if you know what those embryological layers are, you can really see how. Um, it will tie into all these health types and what kind of body shapes and sizes you'll get, which is really, really interesting. Now, as I said, the diplomat is the, we use the animal, the buffalo, to represent the diplomat. And these, the buffaloes, if you think of buffaloes, they're strong, they're steady, they're kind of solid in their own right. So that if, you, if they were by themselves, not many people would, not many things would mess with the buffalo. They're pretty strong and independent, but they also travel in herds. They, they've got a herd mentality. They, they want their family around them. They want people around them as well. So that's, that, that really represents what diplomats are about. And, and also that idea that instead of the zippy fast activators, the cats that are all over the place, the diplomat really, if you think of the one theme that you, want to, that you see going through, through all of their physiology, it's a slow, steady pace in all ways. So they need a slower start to the day. Um, they'll take longer to think through things. Um, they, in terms of, um, because they have a slower digestion and they've got a longer digestive system, digestive tract, you can see how they, they, they won't need as much food. It will take longer to, for the food to go through the digestive tract. So they actually need more time in between meals. So you've got the activators needing five to six meals a day, whereas the diplomats only need two to three meals a day. And lunch, um, lunch is often the biggest meal, or it would be better for the biggest meal to be lunch and, little, and less at night. They also need lots and lots of vegetables and magnesium. So as I say, they need slow and steady, but they also need lots of time and space. They need to be on their own um, plan and time frame. So look at this here. This, this, I think this picture sums it up quite now. They love nature and they just love that space and to be on their own plan in no rush. So you can see the, the contrast between the activator and the diplomat there. So opposite, again, whereas the activator acts first and thinks later and is quite reactive, the diplomat thinks first and then acts later. So the reason for this is because of the hormone serotonin, which is the pleasure-seeking hormone, and this is the hormone that diplomats are most sensitive to. So diplomats can be wary of where they commit energy to. They can sometimes take a while to make a decision, and it can be sometimes, like, even with like, getting into an exercise program, they can kind of sometimes be a little bit resistant or take a, a little bit more time to think about it or before they kind of launch into something. In general, they're just a little bit more tentative. Now, the reason for this is because if they throw themselves into something without putting thought into it and they fail or they don't do well at it, then their serotonin levels are going to plummet. And because they're quite sensitive to serotonin levels, then that's going to really affect their mood. That will make them feel quite low. So for them, it's actually a really normal and natural and good thing for them to really have a good thought through process and decide really well or what they're going to commit and put their energy into. But the, I suppose the, there's, there's good, with everything, there's sort of, um, there's two sides. All of our greatest strengths can sometimes be our greatest weaknesses. And you do seem to see that with the, the paradox of a diplomat, is that it's really, really good that they think through everything and they take time to think of a good decision, a good thought through um, process. But the problem is, is sometimes they can think and then think and then think some more. And they can actually ruminate and actually not make a decision. This leads to analysis paralysis. And this is particularly um, prevalent when their serotonin levels are low. All right, then you've got the crusader. The crusader is the ectomesomit. So again, if you think of the ectodermal layer, that's where the, the brain is, right, um, developed. So they, again, they have a really 
um, logical brain, but they also, things just need to make sense for them. They, they want to know the whys, they want to know the science. Um, and because they're quite, which we're going to talk about in a second, they're quite mission driven, they also want things to be really efficient and productive. So, um, and also if you think of the mesoderm, again, think meso, think of the movement, they also are natural athletes, but whilst the activators are the kind of zippy, um, short, sharp, um, anaerobic type athletes, naturally, the crusaders are more the endurance athletes. So they can go at a reasonably high intensity for a long period of time. So these are your marathon runners and your ultra marathon runners and the Tour de France people. They often get into those sorts of those um, longer um, longer endurance events that have that kind of rhythmic cadence, the running, the cycling, the swimming, things like that, because they really thrive in that situation. Um, their body is more um, of a thinner pencil build, like I was talking about the pure ectomorph is, is kind of that slender build. So they do have a slender build, but because they have that the mesomorph influence in there as well, they have a little bit more muscle than a sensor, uh, but they still are a reasonably um, slim build just with a little bit more muscle. And they are the racehorse. So when you look at these pictures of the racehorse here, can you see how the horses have their blinkers on? And that's what crusaders can be like. They can be so blindly focused that all they are focused on is their mission or their goal or the, or the finish line of the horse. So they can have their blinkers on. And the good thing about this is it means that in society, it's a lot of the crusaders that are charging forward and doing some great things and on an awesome mission to succeed. And they'll put so much time and effort into it. Um, the, 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 I suppose the not so good side of having blinkers on is that sometimes they can forget about people around them and even basic needs. They sort of, these are the guys that don't um, live to eat. They eat to live. It's just, that's just the quick little fuel that they need to, to get them on task to, to keep going. So yeah, now the reason for the, um, them being so blindly focused is because their natural hormone is dopamine. Now these guys um, naturally have more dopamine flooding through their body and they seek out environments where because they feel safe in that environment. So they seek out environments where they will be flooded with dopamine. And dopamine is the, the, the hormone that is sort of the motivation for us to get to the reward. So if we say, we want, we've got this goal, we want to get to, get to X up here, then every milestone along the way that they're achieving, that stepping stone towards that main goal, they are, every time they're achieving those little stepping stones, they are getting, they're getting flooded with dopamine, um, which kind of really helps them. That's why they're so driven and they're really kind of mission and purpose focused. So on the other hand, if, you're, if we've got a crusader that doesn't really have a purpose or a mission or isn't striving towards anything, you'll find that this is actually not a hugely healthy state for them. So it's actually really healthy for a crusader to be focused on something. Now, dopamine can be called the selfish hormone, but as with everything, there's no right or wrong. It just is the way it is. So um, you can think, if you think about the fact that crusaders naturally have a smaller, uh, a smaller body, you can think that physiologically, um, it's actually really important for them to be kind of thinking about themselves and what they're doing and, and, and their, their mission rather than think about everyone else. We'll hear about the more endomorph um, bodies in a second, but if you can think about in, in times of stress on the planet, in times of famine, whereas a more endomorph body that's got more bulk they can, they've got reserves, they will last, they'll last months without much food and they can look after people around them. Whereas a crusader and a sensor, they've got a smaller body. They would not survive if they were giving away the energy and everything to everyone else. So they're actually physiologically driven to be a little bit more self-centered. It's not a bad thing at all. And in fact, you can have a crusader that's so selfishly working towards their, their goal that they aren't really thinking about people around them, but their goal could be to help the whole of humanity. And in fact, that's what PH360, a lot of the, the top people in PH360 are crusaders, and their goal is actually to help the planet and reduce um, chronic pain and disease by the year 2050, and they're working very hard to that end. So you can see how we can call it a selfish hormone, but that doesn't mean that crusaders are selfish, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but because they can be so blindly focused and in a way rigid, um, you can see why they can end up with these sort of stiffnesses. So that kind of theme of rigidity can actually go through their whole physiology. So they can be a little bit rigid in mind. They can be the naturally skeptical ones. Again, they want to know the whys and the science. And that rigidity can go through to their body. They tend to have stiffness up through the spine and through the neck. So really important for them to do things like yoga or massage or um, yes, kind of spinal bending and moving and uh, keeping themselves flexible. And ironically, that will actually help them be a, bit, a little bit more relaxed in their mind as well. So 
the paradox is similar to the activator, but instead of it being more movement-based, it's more mind-based. So their mind is always on and always working to achieve their goals, but they need to rest their mind to become more efficient and productive. Now we're going from one side with the, with the um, crusader, which has as high in dopamine, which we call the selfish hormone, to the other end of the wheel, where you've got the guardian that's high in the more selfless hormone, prolactin. So this kind of goes on an axis. You can't have lots and lots of dopamine and lots of prolactin in your body at the same time. One can be high, the other one is a bit lower. So again, the um, guardian is the pure endomorph. So they would develop more uh, in the endodermal layer, which if you remember back to those slides, we were talking about this, this is where all the digestive organs are built. So this is why, again, they similar to diplomats, they have a slow metabolism. They have a long kind of trans a slow transit time in their gut they've got a naturally they've got a bigger body so they've got a longer digestive tract so they only need a few meals a day again like diplomats the largest meal should be at lunchtime and these guys are the most vegetarian out of the health foods. they need a lot more vegetables and um, they don't do so well with as much animal proteins they also have the largest lungs so it's really important for them to get um, a lot of aerobic exercise and to get fresh circulating air in terms of their body they are the biggest builds naturally. They are a strong build. They, and in fact, their, their body, so they will actually naturally have thicker joints, naturally have um, uh, heavier bones, and they'll naturally um, be the strongest, have more muscle tissue, but they'll also naturally have a little bit more adipose tissue or fat tissue as well. Their body actually feels safe with weight. They feel, when they're, when they're heavy, their body feels safe and strong and like it can protect their family and the people around them which we find in the second is so important for them and that's why um for a guardian body doing resistance training or um, weight training is actually really really important because what you'll find is if guardians go on a, a diet a fair diet and lose a ton of weight fast they'll often put that weight straight back on again and part of the reason for that is that their body actually doesn't feel safe if it's light so if you're doing weight training or resistance training, it's a way that those bodies can feel heavy and strong and natural and safe and good, and it will allow itself to release and reduce their adipose tissue or the fat tissue because it can still be a slimmer, a slightly slimmer physique, but there's still that strength there so it still feels safe. There are actually mechanoreceptors in their joints, particularly in the knee joints, that measure load and it won't feel good if they're feeling too light. So that's a really interesting thing there. The bear is what we um, use the animal to describe the guardian. Now, when you look at the bear there, you think, you think bigger, you think strong, you think stable. They're really sturdy and grounded. These are the people that, you know, they don't get flustered and what I say, they're kind of the grounded um, person that everyone comes to, to for help and support. They're kind of the the anchors of the community and society. They're extremely nurturing. And that is because, they're, um, as I said before, they're really high naturally in um, the hormone prolactin. Now, if you think of what we often can, um, think of prolactin with, is prolactin is actually the hormone that we get releasing when we're breastfeeding. Now, breastfeeding is pretty much the most selfless thing that we could possibly ever do. It's giving away all of our most important and best nutrients to our offspring, and all we expect in return is to, to wipe up pooey nappies and vomit. So it's a, it's a selfless hormone. And it doesn't matter, again, whether they don't have to be breastfeeding, and it doesn't matter whether male or female, they'll just naturally have slightly more prolactin in their system, and they'll seek out situations where they're kind of getting more prolactin released. They're, they're naturally the nurturers. They're very family orientated. They think, in effect, kind of their friends, everyone around them becomes part of their family. And they, they, they give energy to others. They, they're often giving to others. They, they kind of sometimes forget about themselves. It's the selfless hormone. So this is a really, really awesome trait. And there's a reason, as for everything, why they are the way they are. They have a conservation type metabolism. And, and that's because if you think of they're the, they're the protectors of the community, they're the protectors of the family, they're, always, they're thinking out for other people. So in times of famine or stress, they need to have those reserves. It's safe for them to have those reserves so that they can survive to look after the tribe and they can give to other people and look after the people around them and that knowing that they have, you know, they'll be okay. So they are the most resilient to chronic stress. So you can see why they're naturally stronger and why physiologically it makes sense for them to actually retain a little bit of extra body fat. Obviously, 
in today's society, when we're not in times of famine, we're in times of plenty, this can be a little bit of an issue. And it's more the endo, um, the endomorph bodies that will struggle with things um, like a little bit too much fat tissue or feeling like they're overweight. As I say, it's totally natural and it's a really good thing for guardians to have weight and to be strong. Um, but you can get to a stage where you you're, um, don't have too much adipose tissue and there's a, um, but that you still are strong and you'll always have that big, strong build. So they also have this thing where they, they need to have first and then do. So because they're all about nurturing and looking after people around them and about their family, they often think of others before themselves. So they, they, they need to have something before they can do it. They need to gain energy before they expend energy. So um, this is a really important um, thing to think of. And they need to have security because safety of their whānau or their family and the people around them is the most important thing for these guys. So they need to have security. They need to have a good house over, house over their head, be nice and warm as a family. They need to have their finances in order. They need to make sure that all of their family members are, are okay. And what we'll find is that if there are anything going wrong in this area here, that will cause a lot of stress to them because that will be like a stress to their their base physiology and you need to get that stuff sorted before working on other stuff because they'll find it hard to do anything else while there are issues in these areas here. So they need to have that security and safety first, then they can go out and do other things. The paradox for these guys is, as I've said, they're so focused on everyone else and on nurturing people around them is that they sometimes overlook themselves. So um, they can be focusing on other people, but they need to remember that they need to fill their own cup and look after themselves before they're able to, to um, look after the, those around them and those they love. All right, then we have got the connector. The connector is the meso endo mix. So again, movement is really keen, um, key for these guys, just like for the activators. But because they've got, um, they've got the kind of endodermal um, influence there as well, they will tend to have a slightly more conservation type metabolism and they'll have that kind of resilience. Remember, um, they'll have a real resilient body that's kind of hard to make change because it's sort of used to storing naturally. So it means that there's a, there's a, they may need a lot of movement and they'll want to do a lot of movement, but they won't um, re respond to that movement quite as fast as the agile activators. So they need a little bit more volume of exercise and variety of exercise um, to make their body change. Their body is similar to an activator. They'll be shorter. They'll have a more muscular build. Um, they tend to have quite a broad chest. They can have the, the wide shoulders, the V-shaped look there as well. And we use the puppy dog to describe their connectors. The puppies, if you think of puppies, they're fun, they're loyal, they're woof, 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 yapping away, they process out loud. Um, they're easily distracted. So if you think of a puppy dog, one second they're chasing a stick, the next second they're running around chasing their own tail, or they're like, oh, what's this? Oh, this is cool. And that's a little bit what connectors are like as well. Um, they get the energy from being around others. So I suppose the true extrovert. They, and they also love giving and receiving attention. They love to feel special. Now, this isn't a vain thing at all. This is just the same as all the other health types. It's just meeting their basic needs. Now, if you think that it's, if it's important for the puppy dog to kind of um, give and receive attention and, and to um, kind of be liked by people, you can see why it's so important for them to be able to read people and understand them. And that's why these guys are such good vis visual processors. They use the visual part of their brain a lot more. Uh, the visual cortex, but also really empathetic. They understand, they can read between the lines, they can read people's body language. Um, so it's, it's amazing. The reason for all this stuff is because their dominant hormone is oxytocin, and oxytocin is the hormone that's all about bonding and trust and connection. Now, the cool thing about this, this is why they will tend to catch up with lots of people, and they, they thrive in group situations and team sports, and they'll be like the life of the party, and they're always wanting to connect with different people. But the important thing we need to understand about oxytocin is that it's sort of like it's a quality, not necessarily a quantity. So connectors will tend to be like, they use the analogy of um, the puppy dogs um, chasing around in raindrops, trying to catch raindrops on their tongue. And if we think of oxytocin as being the rain, the water, if they're running around going, <laughs> trying to catch raindrops on their tongue, trying to get the oxytocin hit as they're kind of connecting with this person and that person, flitting around here, there and everywhere, you can see how that'd be kind of tiring. Whereas what they really need to quench their thirst is they need to find a tap. They can just lap away and, and, and quench their thirst. And what that is, is that that's them finding their, like some deep connections with a couple of really good friends, people that they can connect with on a deep level. 
Um, and that can often be that can often be hard for a connector because they can often be sp spread their energy wide throughout lots of people. But for them to be healthy, it's actually really important for them to have those couple of deep connections where they can um, have a really good connection. And it also means that, um, which leads on to my next point, is it's really important for them to have that that close person or those close friendships where they can just be truly themselves. Because if you think about it, if you think of the puppy dogs, the, these guys are the positive, fun, friendly people. Um, they bubble around, they're full of energy, they're enthusiastic. But can people be like that the whole time? No. So the problem is, is because connectors love to be loved and they care so much what people think about them, they can sometimes wear a mask. On those days, because they're known for being those positive, friendly, friendly people, on the days when they're not feeling that way, when they're feeling down or they're feeling upset or they've had a hard day, instead of kind of telling the world about their problems, they will put on a mask and they'll be like, yep, I'm fine, yep, I'm cool, yep, everything's all good. So this is a really important thing to understand. Um, again, it goes back to that um, uh, analogy I was using with the oxytocin with that tap, is they need to have those close friends that they can just be their ugly self with. They can be when they're happy and fun and awesome, and they can be where they just, they, they, can, they can take that mask off and just be who they are at all states, which is really, really important. So the paradox, I started off talking a little bit about this for a connector, is they want change fast because they, they're adaptable. They can change fast mentally. They love that change in variety, just like an activator does. But because of their endomorph element, it actually takes them a lot longer for them to change physically. So that can be quite, a, quite, quite hard for them because mentally they want change fast, but physically it takes them a little bit longer. So then we go from one side of the wheel from the puppy dog connector that that loves being around people and gets the energy from everyone else across to the sensor, who's the more introverted naturally and actually gets energy from being by themselves. And it can actually be quite stressful being around too many people. These guys are dominant in the ectodermal layer. And remember, that's where the central nervous system and the skin develops. So they have a very powerful brain, but they're also very, um, they have very attuned with their senses. So they'll be filtering in so much information all the time. That's their, that's, that's their currency is information. That's coming in, kind of bombarding them from all areas all the time. So their strength is in their mind. They're great at processing data. They're very analytical. They love logic. It's all about systems and sequences and Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> um, but if you think about it, if they had more energy put toward the, towards the ectodermal layer, they may have that powerful brain in the senses, but that means that they had less development through the mesodermal layer, which is kind of the muscle and, and, and stuff, and the endodermal layer, which is sort of the digestive tract and, and kind of that bulk. So they will be less muscular and they'll have less bulk and they'll have less digestive power. So they will naturally have a tendency to have issues with their digestion and their circulation, especially when they're stressed. So if you think as well, if they're always thinking and they're very brain orientated, they'll often be thinking, 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 and, and be in a slight stress state where there is that kind of sympathetic nervous system, um, which means as well, it can be sometimes hard for them to be in that relaxed state that they need for good digestion too. So there's so many reasons why for a sensor, um, something that can tend to go out of whack for them if they're under stress or things aren't quite right, is their digestion. And that's why it's really important for them to to have warm foods and to slow cooked meats because that will help digestion. It also helps to warm them. They have less bulk naturally. They have less muscle. They have less fat tissue. They don't have as much to protect them. So using, um, keeping them warm from the foods around them is really, really great idea. And just to keep them warm generally, making sure they've got, got lots of good layers on and they're not, they're not cold. That's why they suit a really hot, humid climate. Things like the tropics are great for senses. Their body is naturally the lightest. They're the most slender or uh, kind of more fragile build. They have the lightest bones naturally. So we use the bird to talk about the sensor. Now, if you look at the birds here, you can see how they're a smaller physique. Um, and if, but you can see, like I think of the hummingbird, where it's like the small, they're, they're, they're kind of petite and little, but their wings are going a million miles an hour. And that's why their brain's doing it's going a million miles an hour. Now, so they're naturally the bird. If you think of the bird, they're light. It's slightly fragile. So if you look at this picture here with the bird and the buffalo, now if the buffalo gets knocked, it's not going to care. It's big and bulky and strong. It's not going to matter. But if this bird gets knocked by the buffalo, you can see how it could break a wing or how it could it could even die. So it's really, really important for that little bird to keep itself safe physically, to be on mentally, switched on mentally the whole time. And that is why they are hyper aware. 
this can sometimes be seen as anxiety, but it's not. It's just hyper awareness. And as I said, this is a biological need. It's called biological fear. It's protection through attentiveness. They can keep themselves safe by filtering in all the information through all of their senses, by filtering in information um, about their environment. That's how they keep themselves safe, which is why their brain is on the whole time. And they're as efficient as the bird flies. They're very linear in the way they do things. And the reason for this is because of their dominant hormone, vasopressin. And vasopressin can sometimes be called the jealousy hormone. It's all about kind of monogamy. They're committed to one task, one rule, one person. And if you think about it, if you've got a brain that's on the whole time and filtering so much information, it'd be really easy to kind of burn out mentally. And having that kind of one task, one rule, that kind of monogamous way of looking, um, linear way of looking thing is actually like a protection mechanism um, to kind of filter out some of the other stuff and just be focusing on one task at a time. Again, as I said, as opposed to the, the extroverted connectors, these guys are naturally more introverted. They're independent. They enjoy alone time. And, and it's really important because it dials down the stimulus. If you think of um, a good way of understanding the sensor is to think of an antenna wire, a sort of a slim, slim thing that's kind of wired. It's on all the time. It's kind of frequency going through it. And it's sort of very highly, um, very, very highly kind of wired. So you can see why it's important for them to have time by themselves and also time to re kind of relax the senses. So something like a warm bath, um, you know, being in front of a nice warm fire by themselves or with someone else, just in a really quiet, um, quiet thing, how that would be really relaxing for their nervous system, allow them to just dial down their senses. Being in kind of loud concerts or around a whole lot of people it, it can be a stress for senses. So the paradox for a sensor is that in order to be safe, they need to sense everything around them. Remember, that's that biological fear I was talking about. But they need to stop sensing to save themselves. Like that antenna wire, if they go if they're on all the time, they'll just burn out mentally. So it's really important for them to learn how they can relax their mind and just take the time and just almost go into sensory deprivation for small periods where they're just letting their body relax and not think and not sense all the time. So yeah, this kind of wraps up my talk of the, the health types. And a little bit of the overview of the science behind pH So I hope that really helps with your understanding and I hope that's been useful for you. Thank you very much.